always give the example, if you have two athletes of equal ability in a race, who wins? It's the one who has a stronger mental capacity. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome and thanks for tuning in to the Two Fit Podcast, hosted by the Two Fit Guys, Jake and Josh. Now, Two Fit, by definition, is actively pursuing a state of health and well being beyond perceived limitations. So, if you are looking to push the boundaries of performance mentally, physically, and everywhere in between, then you have come to the right place. On the Two Fit Podcast, we will be interviewing and having fireside chats with renowned experts from doctors and strength and conditioning coaches to athletes and entrepreneurs. Our goal is to extract tools and tricks of the trade that you can implement, whether you're a world-class athlete, weekend warrior, entrepreneur, or grinding out the eight to five, all in order to assist you on your journey to becoming Two Fit. Hey guys and girls, it's another episode of the Two Fit Podcast, and today you are all in for a treat. We have Elizabeth McCourt of McCourt Leadership Group, and uh, Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so so much for having me, guys. Yes, thanks for making the time uh, up there in New York. Yeah, West Hampton, gosh, sounds so fancy. (laughs) It, It does, it sounds so very fancy, and I will tell you, in the summertime it gets fancy, Right now, it's still a little bit chilly. Already been on a run this morning with her dog and now uh, ready to go. That's right. All right. So, Elizabeth, give people a little background on, on, uh, I know you have experience as a trial lawyer. Um, We'd love to dive into your TEDx talk. Um, But just give people kind of an idea of what McCourt Leadership Group is and a little bit of your background. Oh, sure. So, I, I just formed McCourt Leadership Group. Um, I'm an executive coach and consultant, and I also do some speaking and writing, just sort of uh, stems off from that. Um, My specialty is working with business owners and in particular financial advisors. Since I had 16 years recruiting financial advisors, uh, um, not internationally, just nationally, and I accidentally stumbled into that because I was actually a trial lawyer in New Mexico before I ended up, I say, temporarily moving back to New York 17 years ago. (laughs) But uh, it's all kind of culminated into what my business is today. And last November, I did have a fantastic opportunity to do a TEDx talk at my alma mater, uh, Stony Brook University, which was such an honor and thrill to be able to do one of those. Yeah, so I, I'm interested just uh, what does that process even look like? I know I've heard there's some shows dedicated just to getting you prepared for your TED Talk. I mean, so so how long was that process and in, in preparation and everything? It was actually not as long as you think. I think you can prepare for them for a long time. But the, uh, the process <laughs> getting accepted to the TED Talk happened in sept- at the end of September. Okay. And then the talk was at the beginning of November so I had about about six weeks to prepare. And I had done the talk, a, a smaller version of the particular talk that um, that's how they picked me in my Toastmasters group. I've been involved in Toastmasters for about a year and a half just to you know, practice my public speaking skills. So that was really the the stepping stone into getting the video that they picked the TED talk from to work on the presentation skills to actually do the talk. But it was, you know, it was an intense six weeks because um, it's such an honor to do a TED talk. You really want to do it well. Oh, I'm sure. Now we'll definitely link to that TED talk in the show notes, but uh, for people out there the the TED talk is titled why you should spill your secrets. And Elizabeth, what, what kind of the, just you don't have to go into the whole thing, but what give people a little idea about what the talk is about because it really seemed to to really have a major impact on your life. Yeah, the um, 
why you should spill your secrets is really about opening up yourself and being authentic to people, making a connection and seeing where that leads you. It's it's just empowering to, you know, to to talk to someone and just really show them who you are, not just have a, a cocktail conversation, but tell them a truth about you and and see what happens, even if you if you might be might be afraid to do it, depending on what it is that really, if you trust somebody, um, it's a tremendous opportunity for connection. Yeah, well, I know one thing that really stuck out to me there during your, your TED talk when I was taking some notes was that if you actually have a secret that you need to kind of get off your chest, you actually, there's a, there's a physical release that happens with it as well, which I was, I, in, intuitively, you kind of know that, like there's a, there's a physical stress Like you feel lighter, you know, that it's off your shoulders. But just hearing that there's actual research behind that as well was kind of interesting. Yeah, that was a fascinating element that I added to the original speech that the more I researched, when I found those, uh, the PhDs that had done actual studies and how it actually can save your life in a way for just releasing stress or that tightness in your physical body or let's say you're in a, you know, it's like when you're in a race and you're Mm -hmm. mentally holding yourself back and then you start, you know, believing in yourself how you can go much further than you thought you could. It's really, I think it's really a part of like mental, how mental training affects the body. Mm -hmm. And this, is that kind of predicated on the fact that, that most of us, um, even more so, it seems like the more connected the society is, the the less people interact with each other in a way. Um, due to social media, it's like we have all these platforms, but but people aren't communicating. Um, it's also kind of fall in line with that. You you want to have the filter on, and and you you kind of live your life out of fear of people judging you or thinking less about you. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point because I mean, as we all know, in You know, you're not putting up your terrible pictures in Facebook or social media. You're putting up this, I'm not going to say it's an untruth because it's absolutely true, but um, you can start thinking, gosh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Look at all this that everybody else has. We're really, it's just, you know, we like, we like people better when we see their flaws. It helps Mm -hmm. us feel better about ourselves and um, in, in anything we do, really, it's, it's, you don't have to be perfect all the time. And there's, um, there's a, a empowerment in that element. I had a conversation with a close friend, uh, a few times who would always give me such a hard time that I wasn't on, on Facebook, uh, for the longest time. I had an account. I didn't have a picture. It was, it was practically dormant for, I don't know, seven or eight years. And he'd always say, I can't believe you're not on Facebook. You know, uh, we live apart, I, you know, people are updating their stories and he just kind of was jabbing me about it. And I said, man, I, I really think Facebook could be one of the most depressing platforms out there because mm-hmm. you get on it. And like you just said, Elizabeth, you see your friends or people you grew up with 10, 20 years ago in high school, 30 years ago, and you see their kids and, the, and their events and their li- people love to put up their vacations and rightfully so. And, and you get this uh, protected image of everybody. It makes you definitely can can feel like, well, geez, what am, what am I doing with my life or my activities? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think there's been research done on that very topic. And I, I was also not big into Facebook until really I, I joined the team, Betty, now they're very engaged. But um, I always say, if you're my real friend, then you don't want to message me on Facebook. Just text me or call me. My, you know, your real friends have those, you know, really personal <laughs> connections to you and and really know the real you hopefully yeah that was that was the exact reason i i was never on facebook or any social media for the longest time and i never would have been had me and josh not started this company because some of our advisors told us that that i had to have it and uh i had to be findable so here i am back in the, <laughs> the social media but that's what i always felt like every time i get on there i was just scrolling through people that were supposedly my friends right and i'm I'm looking at their stuff, but I'm not really connecting with them. And I figured that time spent, that 10, 15 minutes 
kind of wasted just searching through the the news feed could have been spent either reading a, an actual news article or actually talking to those people themselves. So, yeah, I think it's very true, and I think for everyone, it's important to have that that realization because you know true personal connection, which is really what my TED talk was about, mm-hmm. is is really essential to people both you know personally and and professionally of course you have to you have to really connect with real people and you know i mean social media is is a necessary it's a a necessary part of society now i mean it's how you and i uh, connected it's true yeah so I'm, i'm curious just what's the response been to your ted talk i mean has there been um Because I imagine, I know when we were listening to it, it's like, okay, there's something that I probably need to to get off my chest right now. So you have that (laughs) call to action almost just from listening to it. And I'm sure a lot of people have got a lot of secrets off their chest and a lot of stress has been relieved, maybe created, but um, Uh depending on the secret, right? But what's what's kind of been the response? You know, it really, it's been a really positive experience and... I connect with a lot of people from that talk. Probably the most immediate uh, positive connection was that uh, some young women in the audience came up to me and said how much it meant to them that they had felt the same way. And Mm. I felt like that that was success. Like for me, if I felt like if I could connect with one person in the audience like that, then it would no matter what happened, the talk would be a success. And and people tell me things for a living. Um, people tell me secrets and goals that they're, they might not want to say out loud in my coaching business. So I think that I have um, a connection with people that makes them feel safe to tell me things. Sometimes I'm amazed at what people tell me because um, I'm not asking for it sometimes. But um, But I think that's if you can create a space where someone can just hold your secret, then I think that there's, you know, there's an opportunity for both parties there. Did you have a, a, almost a light bulb moment when you, did you have ever have a moment where you just thought we should just share share our secrets? Um, Was it something over time or was it something that you just went, you know what, this is what should happen. Um, I think originally, um, I wrote that, uh, I wrote an essay because I bumped into someone and I realized that I, I bumped into that, um, you know, that teacher not to share the whole Ted talk, but I bumped into the person that held my secret and I realized that, that not telling it was like telling myself an old story. Like I always say there's there's, you know, you got the angel on your shoulder that tells you you're awesome and you got the devil on your shoulder that tells you you stink. So it's time to, to take that voice off your shoulder and just, you know, stop telling yourself that you're, you know, you're not good at this or you're, you know, you can't run that marathon or um, you're not fast enough, like to sort of be able to empower yourself to kick that negative voice off your shoulder and move forward. And I'm sure that's had a large impact in your personal coaching as well. Oh, absolutely. I think that's that's one of the things that, believe it or not, I that almost everyone has that voice that says um, negative stuff. And it's a matter of, you know, recognizing that it's it's just it's just a voice. It's normal. Virtually everybody has it at some point and to some level, and to be able to say, "Hey, thanks, thanks a lot for sharing that info. Um, move aside, I'm moving forward." So it's it's really about um, being self aware so that you can achieve your goals. Mm. Elizabeth, are you familiar with uh, physiognomy? No, I'm not. <clears throat> so this was something we were in- introduced to. It's basically a, it's kind of a cool party trick. But physiognomy, it's a, it's a real study. It's a study of the musculature and the architecture of your face and head. <clears throat> and it's it's based on the premise that we store um, stress and, and other things in our musculature. <clears throat> and so anyways, the, is the actual, the people who own the, the custom pool building business in Michigan 
were the ones who went through a course on it all, and it's it's basically a a, a way to read people and get a read on them and and know more about how they operate, <clears throat> just based off the musculature of their face. And anyways, one of the things is that if you have these pockets at the corner of your mouth, they're called secret pockets, which means that you have a secret that you need to get out and tell. And apparently, I have the hugest secret pockets that these two have ever seen. And, wow. Um, yeah, and so I'm thinking, man, maybe I have some secrets that I don't even know I need to get off my chest. <laughs> so uh, if, if that is the case, I mean, how would you suggest people go about you know, finding what they do need to get out there. Oh, that's such an interesting question. And I love that um, because I always say if you, you know, you can tell a lot by a person's body language and you can also shift your energy by changing uh, your body language or your stance. Um, But I would say that someone has to be ready to tell. I mean, um, as a coach, it's different than psychology or psychotherapy it's not about what happened to you in the past. It's about where you are today and where you're going in the future. And I'm pretty direct, though. If I feel like someone is kind of holding back, mm-hmm. I will I will ask them a question and challenge them. Um, so I think that's the way. Someone really has to be ready to share. You can't uh, – I'm not going to dig out someone's secrets, but I might make <laughs> – I might make an observation about something they said and just question them or be curious about something that they said. Like um, if something continues to come up for you, like there's a certain um, a value that's important to you that you're always talking about. Maybe it's one of mine is is honesty and integrity. And if I'm always talking about that, but I haven't noticed I am, Mm -hmm. I I would expect that my coach would kind of explore that in whatever I'm trying to discuss that day, be it with my professional life or personal life. There's, you know, there's certain clues that you might pick up and you'd be able as a coach to just get more curious about that. That makes sense. Yeah. Apparently over time, say if I, if I get rid of all these secrets, then the secret pockets disappear. Or huh. there's something called a burnout line, which is right in between your eyes at the top of your nose. And it's a line that runs horizontally in between the two. And that means that you've been burnt out on whatever it is that you're doing in life, whether that's your job or, you know, home life stresses, this and that. But if you get out of that situation, that burnout line will go away. Just different, interesting huh. things like that. But Yeah, we'll have to so, send you the uh, information yeah, on the lady behind the research. Um, we're actually looking at having having her on the show, but uh, we can connect to you guys as well because I'm nice. sure there's some... See, it just means that we can all look younger if we <laughs> if we unload our secrets and our stress. There you go. <laughs> so, Elizabeth, I, I know that I read that you adhere to the co-active method of coaching. That's right. Could you kind of touch on that and, and uh, Absolutely. let people know what the co-active method is? Yeah, the coactive method is uh, part of the school that I trained at to get uh, internationally certified in coaching. It's the Coaches Training Institute, otherwise known as CTI. And the coactive method is is really simple. It means that when you know when you and I or my coachee when we're talking together, it's not the coach is up here and the client is down here. It means we're we're working together. Um, for the benefit and the betterment of the goals of the client. So as a coach, I'm never going to say, oh, you know, oh, Josh, you're Jake, you should do, you should do this, this, and this. We're going to work on it together. I'm going to challenge, I'm going to challenge you and probe and be curious, but I'm never going to tell you what to do because we're, we're working on the same plane for your goals. So that's really what the, Coactive. It's just together we're working towards it. We're not. Uh, there's no hierarchy, if you will. So, in your experience as an executive coach, what are some of the biggest successes and and failures that you've seen out there? Just kind of curious. Yes, the biggest success is when I have a client actually that says. 
I, you know, I was, I was going to bring this to coaching and ask you, but I realized I didn't need to. I, I actually knew the answer because of the work we've done together. And that was, you know, that was really personally satisfying mm-hmm. to witness that transformation of the client. Um, so I love when a client really, when a client doesn't need me anymore and that they've, that they've really like reached their goals and they've changed and they've, you know, they're challenging themselves. I think that's, that's absolute success. Mm -hmm. And then uh, failure. I don't know if there's failure per se, or I guess I, I always see the potential in someone. And, but of course someone has to want to do the work. So, um, so usually that's someone that ends up, you know, it doesn't happen too often, but they just fall off because they just don't want to, and they just aren't committed to doing the work. And, and coaching is not, uh, it's not a magic pill. Right. There's there, you know, you have to be, you have to be committed and, and want to reach your goals, improve your business, your life, your sport, whatever it is that you know, that you're working on. Cause I, and I do believe that all of them are interconnected, but, but there's, you know, I'm, I'm not the magic fix. Yeah. And I know that you have quite the athletic background, you're a competitive runner, triathlete, and I know you like to take that experience and merge it with the business world. Um, kind of this coaching, you know, athletes have coaches. Why shouldn't business owners, Exactly. Is is that ever hard for some business owners to grasp? It's funny. The ones who really get it are athletes in their own right. And and I don't mean that you have to be uh, you don't have to be a professional athlete. Like I'm I'm definitely not. I'm I'm very much an amateur athlete, but there's a mindset that athletes have and when you have that that mindset of being able to push your body to utilize that mental training, it absolutely translates to business. And, um, and I say that I don't work with people that are failing. I work with high achieving people who, who aren't embarrassed to ask for more and to want more. So that's really, um, that's really where the athlete mindset comes in. It's, um, like when you're doing, we don't, we don't have to do triathlon, but we're committed we're committed to um, doing the training and completing the race and toughing it out, even when it's you know, even when you have your down times um, in the middle of the race, because we all do. And does your coaching of executive athletes differ at all from your other clientele? Uh, no, I would say not really. It's um, it's really a target niche that I enjoy working with. So, I believe also that. The training that athletes use can also be translated perfectly in business and high achieving people will get that. There's always give the example. If you have two athletes of equal ability in a race, who wins? It's the one who has a stronger mental capacity. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a situation where you started working with a client, maybe they didn't have the athletic background and you advise them, Hey, I think that you should set a goal to do a half marathon or a 5k and try to get them to tap into that. You know, I've never suggested something like a half marathon because you have to be a little crazy when you go to that high, those higher levels. But I do, I do encourage people to move because I have a holistic approach um, that, you know, you have to be strong in body, mind, and spirit. So a lot of people I do talk to are active in some way, and I do encourage them, whether it's, you know, sometimes someone can't do a 5K, but I would encourage them to do something, something physical for themselves. That's definitely something I encourage. So, Elizabeth, what's your your day to day look like? Kind of just a, a day in the life. A day in life, huh? 
Well, I, I usually start my day with a really early morning workout, um, depending what I'm what I'm training for. How, so, how early um, are we talking? Um, it depends on the day. I I do have something I do a, one morning a week is a, a really early five. It's a five fifteen uh, strength training class that I like to do. Wow. So that's pretty early. So I, I really like to get out and be finished with my workout before um, eight a.m. And then I can get on with my day. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing, now it just depends. I, I work my week around what I have to do because I have writing commitments because I write um, for On Wall Street Magazine. I do some personal writing. Um, I did a speech last night. So I have, it depends. I have to prepare for a speech. And then I have, um, I have coaching calls that I do. And on occasion, I'm also traveling into New York City uh, mm. to meet with clients. So my week is different every week. As an entrepreneur, that's the that's the beauty of it. You get to schedule your week so that you can um, you know, get all your work done and get a workout yeah. and have a little fun. And uh, <laughs> no, it sounds it sounds fun. How about what's some advice that you would give for people? who want to get up early and get their workout in, kind of have a more productive morning, but just can't seem to do it and continue to hit the snooze button? Uh, I would recommend that if you have a buddy or a class, that you 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 get some accountability partner Mm -hmm. involved because it is it can be really easy to especially when you're just starting out to be like oh I can just sleep another half hour oh I can sleep another half hour I I get that but if you have someone that's waiting for you even if it's someone that you've promised to um I'm going to text you and tell you I got up and did this workout I think that can be very helpful because there's something about the accountability that you you don't want to let that person down or that class people I'm buddies with the people in the class they expect me to show up at 5 15 in the morning so mm-hmm. I don't want to let them down so that really helps me um, get myself moving in the morning yeah that's true does your uh, does your dog wake you up at all <laughs> no she's lazy oh, she likes man. to sleep she's funny she she wakes up with the last person dang you got lucky I <laughs> somehow my dog loves to wake up like six to six thirty, like clockwork, and she'll put. Her, she's not allowed on the bed, but she'll put her her front two feet up there, like, "Hey, it's time to get up," and she wants to be fed right away. And so it's this terrible reward system that I've created, where we're up at six to six thirty, and if she wakes me up, she gets fed. So it's just I've, I've done it to myself. But uh, <clears throat> if anybody else is looking for another way out there, you can just train your dog to wake you up. That's at, right. At that That's time. a good idea. <laughs> So. Unless she's my dog and she's, you know, she's a little lazy. She wants breakfast, but she would actually prefer to sleep a little longer, which is very funny to me. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I'm interested because I've been, I've actually looked in, into the Toastmasters program before, and I'm sure there's some pretty prestigious and, and well-known ones up where you're at. But what does that process look like and in, in, involved and how has it helped you? Oh, I think it's actually a great organization. And there's, um, in your area, since you're in a larger city than I am, you probably have several choices of Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. And you should absolutely, there's, what I really love about it is that it's a safe place to screw up. Right. Um, There is opportunities for, you know, a two-minute practice speech. There's opportunities for a five- to seven-minute speech. Um, but mostly it's people who are looking to get more comfortable either in their jobs, maybe socially, or to do public speaking engagements. So when I have a speech that I'm working on, I take it to Toastmasters and I I know that it's a safe space to to totally screw it up and get feedback. Yeah. And it's a really, I, I, that's what I did last night. I was actually um, in a speech contest last night. Um, I'd won last week, and so this was the next level. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Congratulations. Very oh, cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I didn't. I did not win. I didn't win last night, but what it was is a, a really good experience. What is a speech, um, gosh, like measured off of? I just imagine 
the crowd is just a uh, it's based off the applause or something, you know? Well, there are judges, and I think they. I, I might have, it was my first contest, so I probably should have looked at the parameters more, but I just had a speech that I felt compelled to give, so that was mm-hmm. really the challenge for me. But I think they're looking for poise, uh, purpose, right. and delivery. Yeah, that's good. Now, me and Josh both adhere to the ready, fire, aim method as well, so that's okay. <laughs> but. So you you would like Toastmasters because there's op, there's an absolutely opportunity for that, and like I said, it's a very comfortable environment mm-hmm. to to practice. I mean, it's because everyone's there for the same purpose, so I would recommend, you know, if you have five in your area, go to a couple and see which one you connect with and then go to that yeah. one. And I can only imagine your confidence in speaking's just grown tremendously over the past year and a half that you've been involved with them. Absolutely. I think that, but for, have had I not been in to- Toastmasters, I don't think I would have, I don't think I would have done the, the TEDx talk. I, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, maybe I would have, but I wouldn't have had the confidence that I could really give a, a compelling talk. And so that's, that's really what it gave me. It was all, you know, I guess it was a master plan. So yeah. No, that's that's also another point I wanted to to ask is how is that confidence translated to the rest of your life? Oh, interesting. I think that especially being an entrepreneur, I am really I'm I'm my own brand, so it's important for me to get out there and to to not only to talk to people but to be able to speak um, in front of uh, several people or a larger group. And so it's really given me the confidence of, not that I didn't have it already, but I, I'm i no longer saying all those those ticks that we say when we mm-hmm. first start speaking, the ums, the ahs, the ands. Like one of my, one of my real strengths when I speak is I have, um, I have a pause that I, I use and I don't know you know, how I use it exactly, because it will be like my speech last night, for example, when I just felt that I wasn't sure where I was going, I needed to take a breath. I take a pause and I know I, I felt comfortable doing that because I've been practicing in Toastmasters. So the pause doesn't feel odd. It's just part of the speech and people comment. It's something that I do when I speak. I have these these uh, pauses that uh, that work for the speech. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth, I'd love to dive into um, the topic of leadership because I know you're working with a lot of executives and uh, people in leadership positions. Uh, you as a business owner yourself as well. Um, when, when we knew you were coming on the show, it triggered a thought back to a, a topical devotion I had in my Bible app a while back. Um, I don't do as many as I should, but this was hmm. this was on the character of a great leader, mm. and it, it's a little long winded. So I, I apologize to the listeners for having to hear my voice this long, but um, it's just a couple paragraphs, two two or three short ones, and because I know you adhere to the more of the the self, right, uh, in, in leadership and the, the individual, um, I thought that you would have some great thoughts on this little topic. So here we go. There are over 20,000 leadership development resources available, yet despite the growing magnitude, they have failed to produce good leaders. According to the latest research by Barna Group, 90% of Americans believe the nation is facing a crisis of leadership, 61% say they work for a bad boss, and 33% say that poor leadership at work is the most stressful part of their workday. So what's the problem? You see, most leadership development focuses on management techniques, building competencies, skills, and tactics, but they fail to focus on the most important part of leadership, the leader and his or her her character, integrity, and emotional intelligence. Sadly, there is a perception among those in positional leadership that focusing on the character of a leader rather than skills and tactics, is soft and not practical enough. Hence, most leaders continue to bypass it. 
The results are clear. Continued struggles, dissatisfied employees, frustrated leaders, and chaotic and poor performing teams and organizations. In reality, every tactical problem, even though on the surface seems to need a tactical answer, is ultimately rooted in and can be traced to weak character, leading out of fear, leading out of ego, leading out of pride, and not being able to distinguish right from wrong, having misplaced business priorities, or having misplaced life priorities. And I just thought that's something that everybody can relate to um, on a bad boss or a bad leader or maybe in their own life. Um, if you kind of detach and look at well, how are my thoughts driving my decisions? I Absolutely. I really... I, I really like that statement and that what you read. And I'd love, would love if you'd send me a copy too, sure. because I, I firmly, I, I firmly believe that that's true. And I think that in these conferences that I've been going to recently, these coaching conferences at Harvard and in Germany, this is one of the things that the coaches are trying to change in the corporate environment. There's been books that have been written on this particular topic that, um, that you can't just give someone a rule sheet of how to rule because then you, that's what you get. You get a bad, domineering, narcissistic boss. But if you have a self-aware boss who is tapped into their own emotional intelligence and is interested in their team's needs, desires, skills, opportunities that they want, that you can really have a more balanced and productive company team, whatever it is, to move forward. But if you're just uh, if you're just leading by the iron fist, you're you're really not going to get the best out of people. And companies who have realized that, and organizations who know they need help on that, are the ones that are in the future probably going to be more successful because I think that the corporate America is taking a bit of a turn towards this. Um, and it's the reason why I started doing this, um, my coaching um, for myself on a full-time basis. It's something that I, I always did in my other job. And that's why I had a lot of success. But I just realized that this, this is really where it's, it's at in the future is this, like you said, this emotional intelligence uh, focus without being, you know, without being woo-woo because corporations don't want to be woo-woo. It's not like that. It's just being self-aware. Yeah, I love that you that you hit on emotional intelligence there. And that's something that I need to be more well-read on. But I love every time I dive into it. And there's even some, some studies and some people are saying now that emotional intelligence is a better marker for if you're going to be successful in business and life than just whatever degrees you have or how smart you actually are, your IQ. Is that something that you found is more inherent to the person or can it be honed and trained just like any other skill? Hmm. That, that's a really interesting question. Once again, I think, I, I do think someone has to be self aware enough to want to do the work um, because we've all met you know, high level executives who are, have no self-awareness and, um, and lead in a way that uh, really doesn't bring their team together, that perhaps splits their team up. So it's really about someone's, maybe they get a 360. I don't know if you ever like a 360 report where you get feedback from your colleagues. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that will wake someone up and sometimes that won't do anything. So it's about the person's self-awareness. Can they, can they, maybe not can they change, but can they, can they do some work? Maybe not change a hundred percent, but just can they can they take a few steps in that alternative direction? Mm -hmm. Does that kind of boil down to maybe even someone asking themselves, "Am I making the right call? Period, or am I making the right call for myself?" Mm. Maybe the right call period is also the right call for you at times, but it's what is driving that decision? Is it is it uh, is it based on my benefit or is it based on the 
better benefit of the team. Right, right. Yeah, that I think that's a really good question and really comes down to what both you, you and I said earlier is just about integrity. And can you be a leader that has integrity in all your decisions? Because some decisions are going to be, sometimes a decision that's best for you is terrible for the company. And there's another decision that it could be thorny on both sides. Um, so it's really making, being someone who's able to make decisions that are filled with integrity and, and certainly for the benefit and the betterment of, you know, the company, the team and personally, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a tough balance when you're at the higher echelons of leadership. There is definitely, um, there's definitely a balancing act that has to be done. And of course, you have to walk away feeling good from whatever decision um, that you do make. And it's, it's not always going to make everybody happy. <clears throat> when you're, you're talking and coaching these high-level executives, what's some of the most ad, ad, repeated advice you find yourself giving? Huh. I'd say that's a really that's <laughs> that's so, another good yeah, question. I'm sure I'm sure everybody's different, you know, because they're all at different mm-hmm. walks of life, different businesses, different home life, and everything. But I'm sure there's some some common threads in there. I would imagine. Yeah, common threads. Um, yeah, it's always organic. I'm trying to think of something that jumps out. I mean, very mm-hmm. intense, very intense people sometimes just need to step back for a second and take, I always tell people, sometimes I tell people, just take three deep breaths. Mm -hmm. When your mind's filled with a lot of decisions and no one has to even know you're doing it. You can be at your desk and you can be in a meeting and you could take three breaths and then refocus. So really it's about... Um, I ask people to just take a second to, you know, to focus and to, to clear their mind space a little bit. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's one of the things that I find that I do often with, with any type of client I have. What would be for somebody out there that, that feels that they have a horrible boss or a horrible leader? What, she reminds me of the movie. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what What would be some of the top advice you would give? Maybe Maybe just something in the top three that you would give someone that that feels day in and day out they have a really bad boss. Yeah, they have a really. I mean, it's very tricky because there are obviously there are practical reasons someone might be putting up with it, and there are personal reasons. Um, and so that's something that I ask someone to, to take a look at what there's, you know, we could always say, oh, just, just leave, you know, your friends will say it's fr- coaches are different than a friend. Um, you know, your friends are going to say, leave that job. Why do you stay with that person? And a coach, I, I'm not going to tell someone that they should, you know, leave that job, but I want them to maybe take a look at, what are the practical reasons? And then what are personal? Like, what are you, what are you putting up with? What are you allowing to happen? And to really explore that element of it. Um, maybe there's, maybe there's a confidence issue. Um, maybe there's, I think that's often the case when someone is with you know, with a bad boss, you know, they're maybe making a lot of money, but maybe they think their skills don't translate to another career. So I think that it's really about self-reflection and uh, why you're in that particular situation. And, and checking out, I, I asked them to look at their strengths, like, what are they, you know, what are they good at? What do they have? And how can they, you know, how can they use that in a their career? position or be in an alternative position if that's what they decided they wanted to do because sometimes and sometimes there's you know there's a reason why someone's you know staying at a particular job with a bad boss there's always there's always a multitude of reasons and i think so many people it's back to this fear thing right i think so many people are 
fearful of even confronting their boss or, or maybe not confronting, but even sitting down and, and just laying it all on the line. Um, it doesn't mean right. you have to go in and curse out your boss by any means, but just telling them how you feel and finding common ground. And uh, it's like on the on the side, it just builds and builds and builds. And I have this horrible boss, horrible boss. And it's kind of like, well, what have you done to fix the situation? That's right. Um, it could be. And there could be reasons for that, too. It could be it could be a boss that you can't you can't be honest with. And so that's you know, you're navigating the potholes of the, the working environment. It's I, I've seen it. I've seen it many times and I know it's it's really challenging. And, you know, how do you how do you not actually how do you how do you go into that environment and stay true to yourself and not, you know, and kind of not get sucked into that negativity mm-hmm. and confront it. If, if you can, there, you know, there certainly can be opportunities for that, too. Sometimes, sometimes there's not for a reason. I've, I've seen that, too. Are you familiar with uh, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin? No, I'm not. They, they wrote the book Extreme Ownership. They they own a company called Echelon Front, and they're okay. they're former Navy SEALs. and And their book Extreme Ownership came out. What well, Jake and I read it recently. Uh, came out oh. a few months ago, I guess. And uh, he also has a podcast of his own. Jocko does, but I know we've referenced the book a few times in a few shows. Uh, but great, great uh, leadership book. We will have to send you the information on that. We'll put that in the show notes again. But um, it's very well laid out. It's very applicable. And the premise of the book is, I mean, what the title is, Extreme Ownership. It's about not pointing the finger and taking full ownership uh, of your actions, your responsibilities. Uh, what can I do to change the situation for the better? Absolutely. Because that's really where it is anyway. I mean, as you and I, you, you can't change someone, but you can change yourself in, in what, or get out of a situation. I'll have to check out that book. That's, that sounds interesting. Now, Elizabeth, when you were talking earlier about having some of your, your common threads was having people step back and just take three simple breaths and kind of, you know, center themselves, clear some headspace. Does that come from you? Do you adhere to any meditation practice? Um, it's funny. I always say, I'd like to tell you I'm a terrible meditator, yeah. but you can't, be, you can't be terrible at it. <laughs> uh, but um, I am... I am a beginning meditator and I think it's a great, I think it's a great practice and I, I practice because I'm not particularly good at it. And I say, start with, start with 30 seconds, start with two minutes, like keep it small. So Mm -hmm. that's what I try and do for myself. I just try and keep it small so that I can do it because I, I do, I do know the, the benefits of it. It's just, uh, yeah, it's something. It's something I need accountability on. That I need to add to my repertoire. Yeah. But I do, I do highly, I do highly recommend it because I do think it can be very, very helpful. Do you use or recommend any, you know, guided meditation apps, or do you just do it um, unguided, doing some diaphragmatic breathing techniques or something? Um, I do. I do yoga, so I do some meditation in that. And I've been toying with some apps. I just tried the Headspace app. Mm, yeah, that Australian accent. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So that one's. Oh, do you do it too? I did the uh, the free ten days, and then after that, he started asking too much money of me. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't. I I've been trying that one, but um, to be honest, I I often fall asleep in the middle of it. <laughs> so so yeah. I still haven't made it through my free ten. So uh, I have to investigate it, and I think, yeah, for me, it always has to be. Um, I don't know. I just have to, I have to resonate with whatever it is. Otherwise I become, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We bring it up because people are probably tired of talking about it, but I feel like we bring up meditation a lot, but just because we, uh, we think it's so powerful. It's such a powerful tool and, and, uh, it doesn't have to be woo woo, you know, but (laughs) exactly. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be 20 minutes. So like I said, I'm 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 working my way towards not falling asleep in the middle and going beyond my two to five minutes. <laughs> do you journal as well, or do you advise journaling? Journaling because uh, I could see how kind of tying back in your TEDx talk, 
the sharing your secrets, even if it's not with a person, do you see the power uh, of journaling it and, and putting that on paper? Absolutely. I'm, I'm a huge fan of journaling and I probably have been doing some semblance of that my entire life. Um, and I, I think you're absolutely right. In my talk, I say that if you can't, and this, like the PhD say, if you can't, if you can't tell anyone, you know, write it to yourself in a journal and it can also be very, very cathartic. Um, so I do, I do journal and I write and sometimes I write and I, I'll publish an essay that I've written. Um, it just depends, but I think it's extremely helpful. And it doesn't have to be, once again, it doesn't have to be 20 pages. It could just be a couple sentences, a paragraph, um, a quote that you like. I think that, that journaling is tremendously, um, tremendously helpful. And you don't have to show anyone. So it's it's private. I mean, me and Josh, we... We're creating more content now, writing more blog posts, the podcast, and different things. But sometimes it's hard. I'll, I'll be honest with you, just finding the inspiration to write, or you know, the ideas there. But I just don't have the motivation to actually sit down and do it. So, how how do you structure that time and and tap into that inspiration and motivation to write during your day? Sometimes I I totally understand. Sometimes you just need to give yourself a deadline. Mm-hmm. Um, because writing is one of those things. And I'll tell you, I had, um, I had a very short article I needed to write and I needed to get finished by yesterday. And I, I procrastinated and I wrote it and I hated it. And then at about 154, I said, you need, I didn't know it was 154. I said, you need to get this out to your editor by two. And I looked at the clock and I was like, 154. Oh my gosh. So but I did it. So sometimes it's just a deadline that you just need to force yourself. And once again, I would say accountability. Like when you say, I'm going to write one blog post by Wednesday, then really, you know, hold yourself to that. Write it down, put a sticky note on your computer and really commit to it. Like don't right. say you're going to write, don't say five blog posts. Yeah. Like that's one of the things I challenge my clients when they say, I'm going to do five of this. And I said, okay, that's a really great goal. And I would love to see you do that. But what are you going to, what is the goal that you're really going to do that you're going to feel great about? And then they say, um, I can do the five. And I say, great. Or they say, you know what, if I can get, if I can get one done and start on a second, that's my goal. And I say, great. Can you commit to that? So I yeah. think it's really about committing to yourself in some way, whether it's, you know, to you guys, to each other or a sticky note or somebody else that, that, that helps to get it done. Yeah. I really do enjoy writing once I get into it and I can, I can knock it out really fast cause I just immerse myself in it. But maybe we, me and Josh are viewing it the wrong way. Cause I missed a a meeting with our mentors the other day that, that Josh was in at. I had, I had another conflict of schedule, and they told me that I had to write two blog posts a day until we met again as punishment. Oh. But, <laughs> I think that's tomorrow evening. Yeah, so about... Well, I, I can give Jake's going to be writing all day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you another little trick Sure. that I use is pick, like, wherever you're sitting, pick something in the room. Mm. Um, like, for example, I picked a lamp and a couple of weeks ago and I wrote this, I just said, I just described the lamp in the first sentence. And then I wrote, I wrote this piece that really wasn't really about the lamp, but the lamp got me started. So just pick something, anything in the room and write a sentence about that and kind of get your mind and your pen and your hand moving. Oh, that's great. That is great advice. I love that. Have you used any of the, I know that Google Docs rolled one out, the uh, speak typing, you know, you can speak to, you can just have your phone sitting there or your computer with the microphone on your laptop and you can like speak. A dictation. Yeah, it's like a dictation and Google Docs has introduced it. Um, have you ever tried anything like that if you're, if you're experiencing some writer's block but you can just verbalize it like a conversation and almost where it kind of build you a template almost where you've got all these words and then you can go back and, and it gives you a place to start editing and, and crafting the final document 
I, I think that can be a great idea um, if it works for you. For me, I'm very, um, I'm very tactile. So I, I sometimes want to be old school and write pen to paper and not, you know, and not fingers on a computer. So if I'm really feeling stuck, I will go pen to paper. I've tried some of these, um, the, you know, the talking and the, you know, when you talk to the thing and it comes, it comes out. And I guess for me, it's part of my process is that tactile nature. But I would say if the, if words work for you and that is how you can get your ideas out, I think that's a great idea. I, I end up usually writing and then when I read it out loud, then I edit it. So that's, I just do a different process, but I think that can be, I think it can be a great way to get started. It just depends on how you prefer to work. Sure. Yeah. No, I think I'm there with you too. I feel like I just express myself so much better in written form, you know? Yeah. But Something about pen to paper, yeah, I guess. Maybe it's all those secrets I have. <laughs> well, well, Elizabeth, is there anything else you'd like to share? Gosh, no. I think that uh, it's been really fun, guys. I really appreciate you having me on your show. It's been really enjoyable speaking with you. Yes, this has been fun. A lot of a lot of great uh, applicable things out of this for sure that I think our listeners will definitely appreciate. I'm so glad. Yeah. Well, where can people follow you and find out more about you? Yeah, you can go to my website, which is www.mccourtleadership.com. And I'm also very active on Twitter, which is how you guys and I connected. And that is at, it's E.C. McCourt. So Elizabeth C. like car, McCourt. Okay. That's my that's my Twitter handle. All right, Elizabeth, well, thank you for the time that you gave us and, and for sharing everything. Yes, oh, th- much appreciated. Thank you, guys. Yeah, sure. Thanks. It's been it's been really great being on, and thank you for for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Two Fit Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Two Fit USA, the sports nutrition company owned and operated by the Two Fit Guys. To show our appreciation for you tuning into the podcast, we would like to give you a 10% off your entire order at 2fitusa.com. All of our products are sugar-free, paleo-friendly, gluten-free, non-GMO, and a whole list of other buzzwords. So hop on over to 2fitusa.com. Don't forget to use your promo code FIT1, that's F-I-T-1, at checkout. We highly value and appreciate your feedback, so please leave a review about the products and the podcast at our website, 2 under the podcast and products pages. You can also leave a review on iTunes. Now, if we happen to read your review during one of our podcasts, you'll receive a one-month free subscription of all 2Fit products. So write something noteworthy. If not, we probably won't read it anyway. So go leave a review, listen to the next episode, and till next time.